Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 40 of the Summit for Wellness podcast. I'm your host, Brian Carroll, and today's episode is brought to you by Thrive Market, which is an online shop for all of your health and wellness foods, all at wholesale pricing. So if you want to learn more about Thrive Market, go to summitforwellness.com slash thrive. In today's episode, we will be talking about an issue that I have struggled with for a very long time because I was exposed to this problem within my household, and a lot of people are probably exposed to these same type of issues, and they don't realize that they're being exposed to it, and that is mold toxicity. Uh, Being up here in Washington, we see a lot of mold issues, but it's not just if up in these wet climates. You can have issues within your home. You could have pipes that break and it soaks your house and your flooring and your walls and you don't realize how much damage it actually is causing behind the scenes and then it can wreak a lot of havoc on your health. So I brought on Dr. Kelly McCann of thespringcenter.com to talk all about mold toxicity and how to check your environment to make sure you're living in a very safe space. So let's go into my conversation with Kelly and learn a lot about mold toxicity. Dr. Kelly McCann is a functional medicine doctor who has always been interested in providing holistic, patient-centered care for her patients. She is a board-certified internal medicine doctor, which is a doctor for adults, and a pediatrician, and having completed a double residency in medicine and pediatrics. She has also completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, and has also been certified in functional medicine, integrative medicine, medical acupuncture, environmental medicine, and loves studying about chronic infection and biotoxins illness. She is also the founder of Partners in Health at the Spring Center in Costa Mesa, California. Thanks, Kelly, for coming on to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Kelly, I would love to just dive in to your background a little bit and find out what got you so interested in, to, in the medical world, and then what also made you so interested in mold itself? Sure. Um, I started out actually as a music major in college, and this was about the time that <clears throat> um, there was not much in the way of jobs, so I went back to school got a master's in library science, and then decided I liked studying the mind and the brain, and so got into medicine that way, but was really interested, even from the very beginning, in acupuncture and more holistic kinds of medicine. And I had made a deal with myself that if I got into medical school, I would go, and if I didn't, I would go to acupuncture school. So as it turns out, I got into medical school, so that was the the path that started me in studying medicine. And I always had an interest in holistic medicine and so pursued that as much as I could throughout my training and residency training. And then finally, when I graduated, I was able to go and do a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, as you mentioned, which really laid the foundation for my understanding of complementary and alternative medicine, functional medicine, acupuncture. And since then, I've continued to pursue um, these interests looking at environmental toxins and how those impact our health. And one of my colleagues had mentioned um, that I needed to explore mold. And so I discovered Richie Shoemaker's work on mold and started testing myself, testing my patients. But then part of the real education in mold happened when I was exposed to mold myself. I was living in a house and um, realized that there was water damage inside of the house and ended up losing virtually everything that I owned at the time. And this was not too long ago, it was just a couple of years ago. And that's been quite a journey for me, uh, learning 
all about mold, how to deal with it, how to deal with contractors and houses, and then um, continuing to get myself better so that I could go on and help patients. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about the making sure your living space is clean and uh, mold free. But let's go into why mold is so dangerous to someone's health. Why is it so uh, potent to our health if we're living in these type of places? Well, there are certainly are some people that may genetically, for whatever reason, be more able to tolerate mold. But many of these molds produce mold toxins, um, which is not a living part of the actual organism. But these toxins are toxic to other molds as well as to uh, humans. And in many ways, we have self-selected for these molds because we use antifungals, um, and these molds then produce the mycotoxins, which then go on to um, impact our health. So it's not necessarily the mold that's affecting the body. It's more of these mycotoxins that might be in the air or being released by mold or fungus that's within the body? It can be both of those things. In fact, when you have a situation where there's water damage in a building, not only are there molds there and mold toxins produced by the molds, but it's really a toxic soup of organisms. There are fragments, there are bacteria, there are viruses, there are protozoa, there's all sorts of organisms that are in those moldy environments and any one of these things can cause health problems. Um, the molds also produce what are called volatile organic compounds or VOCs, which is the smell. So when you smell that musty smell, those are microbial VOCs and those in, in and of themselves have health impacts. They can cause headaches and fatigue and respiratory issues, neurological things. So it's the molds, the mycotoxins, the microbial VOCs, and that whole toxic soup in the water-damaged environment. And you named off a few of those symptoms, but can you go into some more symptoms that mold toxicity can express? Sure. So some people might just have respiratory issues or fatigue, but the list of symptoms is very, very long, actually, of all the things that can show up when people have mold exposure. People can have headaches, they can develop chemical sensitivities, they can have endocrine problems, adrenal problems, um, they can have difficulty oxygenating their lungs. They can have a lot of memory problems, a lot of neurological problems. They can de develop chronic pain. They can de develop abdominal issues or gastrointestinal issues. For example, when I was living in my moldy building, all of a sudden I was having a lot of trouble eating a variety of different foods. So I couldn't eat gluten or dairy. I developed um, sensitivities to almonds, rice, peas, eggs, strawberries, tomatoes, peppers, oranges. The list became incredibly long because the mold and the mycotoxins were damaging the intestinal lining. So any, any system in the body can be impacted by these mold and mycotoxin exposures. Are they also affecting the microbiome as well that's living inside of the guts? Yes, it's quite possible. There's some early literature to support the idea that it is changing the bacterial flora, the microbiome, and the what we call the mycobiome. So microbiome is the bacteria in the gastrointestinal system. And then we're just starting to learn that there's actually a fungal mycobiome, M-Y-C-O, in the GI tract as well. It's a very small percentage of, of the organisms that are in the gastrointestinal system, but those two are being impacted by these exposures. So do we typically find this in places that have water damage or high humidity or a lot of moisture? Yes. Any number of um, External environments can impact the, the potential for water damage. So 
in the Northwest where it rains a lot, where you are, Brian, that's a, a potential uh, issue if the buildings um, are not properly constructed. And even in Southern California where we don't get a lot of rain, I've actually found because the environment doesn't require um, certain kinds of building standards. So for example, we don't have a snow load here in Southern California, so you don't have to build a roof such that it can hold those loads of snow. I, I think that um, the construction is not optimal. And so there's potential for water damage in a lot of places. Um, we also have sprinkler systems that might hit the house on a regular basis and not really even think about the fact that every time that sprinkler system and the water hits the house, that water can seep under the house and set up a situation where mold can grow. And it's interesting that you talk about these different building environments because up here in Washington, where I'm at, they build houses all year round. So it's right now it's winter and it's absolutely dumping rain. And you see all these half finished houses that are getting absolutely soaked by the rain. So what do you think about these building practices? And do you think these contractors actually go in and dry all the wood out before they sell these houses? And is this leading to exposure of mold right when people start moving into these places? Those are really good questions, and I will be the first one to admit I, I don't know a lot about construction, although I've had to learn some um, information. It would make sense to me that if somebody is sensitive to mold, they really need to be conscientious about the places that they're moving into, and so those building practices for some percentage of the population might be really uh, suspect. And there, there certainly are some people that can move into a moldy building and not necessarily get sick. Um, either they have a hardier constitution or they have different genetics. But um, if somebody already knows that they have a mold sensitivity, they need to be very um, conscientious about their housing choices. And is there ways to test the environment within the house to see if it does have mold spores in there? Yes, there are several different ways to test. Most of the environmental, uh, indoor environmental professionals, the mold inspectors, as, it, as they're called, do a variety of different tests. Usually they are using air tests as their gold standard. Now, Air tests can be helpful, but in many of the situations, the mold and the mycotoxins and the things that you're looking for can be very heavy. So for example, black mold like Stachybotrys is very dense and heavy. It's not going to be hanging around in a cloud floating through the air. And so the, the air tests might not pick up all of the potential mold that's present. Um, it tests that a homeowner or a person looking at a, a building can order. There are some tests that they can order themselves online. There are a couple different companies. Um, one company in particular that I um, look at offers tests that um, are called ERMI tests or Environmental Relative Mold Index Tests or the lesser expensive test is called a hurts me test because mold hurts you and me. <laughs> it, ERMI, ERMI is spelled E-R-M-I and then the hurts me is H-E-R-T-S-M-I. <clears throat> the ERMI test looks at 36 different molds, 26 mold toxin producing molds and then 10 not bad molds as we say and the person gets a score they look at the number of toxin producing molds and the um, number of non-toxin producing molds the higher the number in the ERMI score the more dangerous mold exposed that building is 
And there are two options there. There's a vacuum option and a cloth option. Uh, when you go to order the test, I tend to recommend the cloth option. And then what the person does is they collect dust in the area of concern in the house and then send it off. The Hurts Me works very similarly. There's a vacuum option or a cloth option, but it only reports the the DNA mold um, the, from about five different molds. And so you have to convert that into a score. Again, the higher the score, the more concerning the building environment. So if the test comes back positive, then what are some steps people can do to improve their living environment? So typically, if you have a abnormal ERMI test, Hertz me test, it, it really, what they want to do next really depends upon do they own the home, how much money, resources are they going to be able to allocate to uh, renovating the house, how extensive do they think the water damage is. Um, so usually I'm encouraging my patients to do an ERMI or hurts me test depending upon their circumstances and then based on the results they may need to hire an official mold inspector who can then go through the house and identify all the areas of concern all the potential areas of water damage and the report that the mold inspector creates then becomes the blueprint for the mold remediator to do the work. So ideally the mold inspectors are not the same folks who are the remediators because obviously there's a vested interest if they are the same person. Um, and unfortunately mold remediation is incredibly expensive for most situations. So patients um, and people really need to decide, can they afford um, tens of thousands or $100,000 in remediation? Uh, or do they need to move? Or, you know, obviously if they're renting, that becomes a different situation altogether. Does mold tend to spread quickly throughout the house, especially in like cloth type fabrics and stuff like that? Or does it take a long time for it to uh transition throughout different areas of the house? That's a really good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that question. I, I would say in the house that I was living, which was a rental property, um, I was there for about a year. I just couldn't leave um, and was hoping that I was going to be able to wash my belongings and salvage my belongings um, and I wasn't able to. So if somebody is in a moldy place for a shorter period of time, if the mold is not quite as extensive, that's quite possible that they can salvage their things. Um, so again, I, I, I wish I had a better time frame to answer your question, but I, I'm not entirely sure. So you said you tried washing some of your stuff, but you weren't able to salvage it. How do you know if it's unsalvageable? Because by the time I um, identified it, what, what I ended up doing was moving <laughs> into a different environment, taking all of the belongings that I wanted to try and salvage. I washed them multiple times uh, with certain kinds of products that were intended to help remove mold and mycotoxins. Um, I put them in storage um, and left them for several months to see if one, once I was feeling better and in a mold-free environment, I could go back and feel okay. And what happened was essentially I would go back to the storage unit, I would open up a container of some of my belongings and I would either cough or get a headache, feel unwell, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to salvage those things. So that would be 
my recommendation for somebody in a, in a similar situation is that the things that you can clean, the, the wooden furniture, the uh, clothes that you want to keep, your, you know, purses, boots, shoes, etc. Those probably need to be cleaned and put in storage um, and then reevaluated at some time down the line. Um, even my furniture, because the house was so terribly moldy, I had, you know, old antique uh, furniture. I, I couldn't salvage it. I couldn't keep it. It just made me sick. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. So uh, are you opening it? opening up the containers and seeing if you smell must or are you looking for an instant type of headache or is it what what does that look like you know it may depend on the person their level of sensitivity for me yeah i would literally open up the container and uh within a few minutes i just had a sense of unwellness um a headache Maybe my eyes were kind of itchy or irritated. I have had other patients do similar uh, procedures, and one woman in particular would describe this like wave of depression and uh, just pain come over her when she would be exposed to um, moldy belongings. Um, so each person might have a different experience, but typically it's pretty quickly that they experience whatever constellation of symptoms they're going to have because hopefully now they're in a, a mold-free environment and they're starting to clear those mycotoxins out of their bodies and they're feeling better. So they can more easily differentiate between, I feel well and I'm looking at this stuff and now I don't feel well. Yeah, so the patients have to be aware of their own bodies and their own symptomologies as well to understand that this doesn't quite feel right. So there must be something going on with this clothing or this furniture as well, I'm guessing. Correct. So there's been a lot of discussion of, uh, amongst different practitioners that mold and fungus can feed on certain things within the body, such as um, elevated glucose levels or uh, heavy metals. Is this something that you uh, believe as well? And if so, what do you think about uh, removing these from the body when you're treating people? Those are great questions. Most of the time what happens in it, with patients who are in moldy environments are that their GI tract is affected. And so as I explained for myself, I, there were so many foods all of a sudden that I couldn't eat. Um, so I think as somebody is trying to heal themselves, they may find that they need to reduce grains or eliminate grains, eliminate sugar, eliminate certain foods that they might develop sensitivities to, especially things like uh, gluten and then many of the grains which are contaminated and we can talk about mold and mycotoxins in in food so avoiding those foods to reduce the ongoing exposures that might con contribute to a sense of not feeling well is important in terms of heavy metals um, I think the relationship is more one that I would describe as um, the concept that we have in environmental medicine is that the body is a bucket and everything that you've been exposed to over the course of your lifetime is in that bucket. And when you are in a moldy building, um, all of the it, all of the environmental toxins come into play because you're you have reached a threshold and your 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 bucket is overflowing and now you have lots of symptoms. And so whatever we can do to lower that bucket will be helpful. However, one of the things that I've discovered over the course of treating patients is that when patients are in a moldy building and when they're really fragile and sick, trying to get heavy metals out by doing chelation is um, is not really optimal. They, they just don't have the resiliency and the reserves to handle um, 
an aggressive chelation treatment protocol at that point. Um, they may be able to do sauna, they may be able to do some gentle kind of detox, but aggressive chelation, I would wait until they were out of a moldy environment and on their way to feeling better. Usually I'm looking at 50, 60, 75% uh, back to their sense of well-being before I'm going to institute a, a, an aggressive IV chelation protocol to remove those heavy metals. So at some point you have to decide whether the person's able to go through a certain protocol and then if doing too much is going to be overwhelming to the body. So that's where you're talking about doing the chelation at the beginning stages of someone that's really um, inoculated with mold could be too much for them to handle. Yes, because they're already depleted and now you're trying to pull out metals and in the process you're often pulling out minerals. And I, I think it's just too much for the body at that point. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And in there you mentioned foods that have mold in it. And I would love to hear about all these different foods that might not be as um, mold free as we would expect. Yes, it's actually quite disturbing when you start looking at the literature. So Richie Shoemaker, the the um, father of mold, um, who really brought our understanding uh, of mold and mycotoxins to a new level, didn't really discuss um, how moldy foods can be. But when we look at especially the veterinary literature uh, and some of the developing world literature, mold and mycotoxins in food can have a huge role in health and disease. Um, there were a number of uh, historical uh, cases. In fact, there was a, a, a syndrome with a, a funky name um, that impacted over 100,000 Russians in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s because they ate grains that had been lying fallow uh, through the winter. And so these grains were clearly contaminated with mold and mycotoxins. And these um, poor people died pretty horrific deaths. They had hemorrhaging in their lungs and in their GI tract, and they got bone marrow suppression. So that was pretty awful. Uh, we've now learned that <laughs> eating moldy foods is not good. Um, but then when we start looking at uh, grains in particular, it's very difficult to keep them mold free. And it tends to cause all sorts of uh, problems. We understand now that these, the mycotoxins from these grains can cause, as I mentioned, intestinal hemorrhaging, diarrhea. Um, in the, the veterinary literature, um, the cows and pigs that eat these contaminated grains um, lose their, their um, offspring. They have uh, ab abnormal um, sperm counts and low tes testicular development. Um, they don't eat very well. They, they just do very poorly. They can have neurological symptoms as well. Um, and in, in some of the literature looking at, um, our food sources, for example, there was a, a, uh, study in Spain looking at pizza dough and they look for nine different mycotoxins and they found at least three mycotoxins in a hundred percent of the pizza dough and not only that um, you can get contaminated uh, dairy products too so you feed a cow contaminated grains then they produce milk that's also contaminated with mycotoxins so um, grains dairy, and some of the nuts and apples are some of the foods that are most highly contaminated with mold and mycotoxins. Yeah, pizza sounds like it's just a bad deal because you have <laughs> the mold in the dough, you have the mold in the cheese. Yes, no more pizza for you. <laughs> oh, man. There's so many people that are going to be sad about that one. <laughs> I know. And and even if it's gluten-free, you're still, you're still getting the contamination from the grains that are not 
not gluten-full. In fact, corn is one of the most highly contaminated grains, and it's um, it's really a bad player. There was uh, another uh, article that came out about um, some a contamination along the Mexican-American border and the rates of uh, what are called neural tube defects, things like spina bifida and even babies that were born without a brain, anencephaly, skyrocketed because of uh, contaminated sources of corn in the, in the human um, food sources. So really uh, very tragic things can happen. It's, it's, uh, it's not just, um, darn, I can't eat pizza anymore. So <clears throat> yeah, that's um, really good to know. Yeah, it is. It is good to know <laughs> that whole fad of gluten-free. Uh, it's more than just a fad. It's really um, for health purposes, I think, to minimize our grain, uh, grain intake. Exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned nuts and seeds. Can you label off a couple of the most um, most likely to have mold amongst those? So typically the ground nuts like your peanuts, um, but even walnuts have been found to have um, mycotoxins in them. Um, but yeah, when I when I look at the literature, it's tree nuts, it's figs, it's ground nuts, it's kind of all of them have the potential to be contaminated. Um, now, I'm a big fan of nuts, and obviously eating gluten free and grain free, you kind of need to eat something. Um, so typically, the ones that get the bad the bad rap are the peanuts, which would be your ground nuts, and typically the uh, the tree nuts are a little bit better options. Do you think there's a difference between the nuts that are in the big bulk bins at the store compared to the ones that are already prepackaged in bags? You know, I, I really don't know. I, we do also understand that, that coffee is... Uh, highly contaminated in the U.S. And one of the ways to minimize the mold contamination in coffee is to um, go with a uh, one source, um, kind of like a single source um, coffee. So it may be that if we're, you know, buying our nuts at the farmer's market, and we know where we're getting our our food from that might be a higher quality option but it it may depend on so many different variables i'm not i'm not quite sure how to communicate to um, your listeners how best to sort that out for themselves yeah and just transporting coffee beans all the way from south america up to here that alone can allow plenty of time for mold to start growing as well. So it can definitely be tough to find quality beans. Yes, absolutely. And we might not be able to see it. Like, you know, when you have moldy strawberries, it's quite clear that there's mold growing on those strawberries. And I, I don't know so much about the coffee, although it may be that that jittery feeling that people get when they drink coffee, it's perhaps less the caffeine and more likely the mycotoxins. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so there's also correlation between uh, mold and other diseases, which can make mold toxicity really tough to uncover. Can you talk about different um, ways that we can try and figure out whether it's mold or something else? Uh, yeah, good question. This is... Um what I do day in and day out. And it's, and it's really pretty tricky because the list of symptoms that are possible with mold exposure is pretty similar to the list of the symptoms that you might get with Lyme disease and the symptoms that you might get with certain kinds of environmental toxin exposures. And, and mold and these chronic infections and these environmental toxins all trigger oxidative stress and then the oxidative stress triggers inflammation in people and then they get this constellation of symptoms. It, mold can cause, can trigger 
autoimmune conditions in genetically susceptible people. There's been literature to support the idea that mold and fungal overgrowth can manifest as ALS and MS and a bunch of other neurological conditions. So it gets really, really tricky to sort it all out. Right. So how do you start trying to figure out which direction to go with it? Take a good history. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, that's where... Um, the patients who are aware of their own experiences, aware of the potential risks, um, are really helpful. So all of your listeners out there that are educating yourselves, kudos to you, because that makes my job that much easier. If somebody comes in and says, well, I'm having these symptoms and you know, I'm smelling this moldy smell in my bathroom, then we might explore that. Um, so it really, it really does become um, a individual history. What are your exposures? Um, kind of exploration, and then that determines which pathway we go down. So you mentioned uh, kind of the moldy or musty smell in the bathroom, which made me think of a couple of things ozone and dehumidifiers. So do you think those can be beneficial to uh, the environment and trying to remove the moisture or the mold itself? Certainly dehumidifiers would be helpful, especially when you're living um, in the Northwest as you are uh, <laughs> trying to stay on top of the, the moisture would be important. Now, I'm less concerned about mildew in the bathroom tiles in the shower because uh, you know there's lingering moisture in the air what I'm really concerned about and what tends to cause the problems is if there is a leak in the plumbing behind the wall so at least in California, that's where the problem is going to be. In places where you have a lot more rain, for example, um, it may be the concern uh, would be, is there like, um, uh, what's it called, the, the basement or even some sort of enclosed areas uh, that there may not be a room there, but there's ample place for water to come in either through the roof space or um, the crawl spaces. And if there's mold growing in some of those places, that travels through the house and contaminates the house and all the things in it and can make people sick. So. I think that having dehumidifiers would be helpful at lowering the overall burden of moisture, um, but it's really the construction of the house, how, how watertight is it, um, and how well constructed is the plumbing such that there's no leaks and therefore there's no water damage on the inside of the house. Those are the things that I think about as being more important. Now, in terms of ozone, uh, I looked at a lot of the ozone literature in preparation for uh, many of these talks that I've been giving on mold, and we use ozone um, to treat contaminated grains, to treat contaminated nuts, and there is benefit, um, at least in, in those particular circumstances, you may lower the burden 50%, but it doesn't go to zero. Um, none of the ozone machines that are used commercially on the foods uh, completely eliminate the mold and the mycotoxins. And then there was one study in particular that looked at using ozone on furniture that was water damaged and mold contaminated. And there was benefit um, the levels of mold and the inflammatory cas 
the inflammatory cytokines, the inflammatory chemical messengers, uh, were diminished by use of the ozone. But again, it didn't go to zero, so it's not 100% effective. Um, I did try using ozone uh, in my house. Now the trick with ozone is no living organisms <laughs> like pets, plants, uh, humans can be around when you're running the ozone machines, um, but I didn't find that it was effective in my case, and perhaps that was because the burden of mold and mycotoxins was so great. The other thing to uh, remember is that the mycotoxins are not alive, so it, the ozone isn't going to be able to kill those mycotoxins. It may be able to break apart the mycotoxins, so they're that deactivates them somehow, um, but we don't know that for sure. Yeah, that's really good to know. So now we're at this point where we have some ideas of what to do about the environment, but what are some treatment protocols people can do for themselves or working with a practitioner like yourself that you would put people on? Um, hey, Brian, before we go on to people, I, I do want to say a couple other things uh, in terms of treating the environment. Um, okay. Air filters are, especially HEPA air filters, can be very helpful uh, at cleaning the air as much as possible. Again, they're not 100%, but um, I was running <clears throat> several HEPA filters in that house, and that really did make it tolerable. Um, so those are important things that people can do, especially if they're not able to get out of the situation uh, that they're in. And then there are a couple of machines called air reactors, which utilize some form of ozone in certain circumstances and some form of uh, uh, UV light. And I've had feedback from other patients that they felt that those made a big difference for them. So if financially it's not possible to remediate or move, um, there are some things that people can do in their environment, um, like air filters and potentially air reactors that may be very helpful. Oh, that's really great. I didn't even know about those two. So that's thank you for bringing those ones up. You're welcome. Now, back to how to treat the people. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So one of the ways that Shoemaker originally discovered uh, mold and mycotoxins in the treatment was to use a uh, an old-time cholesterol-lowering medication called cholestyramine. Cholestyramine is a binder, um, and it's actually a powder. It's taken in water, and it binds the mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal system. Um, the challenge with some of these mycotoxins is they're incredibly small. They're smaller than the cell um, membrane themselves. And so they float in and out of the cell membranes. Um, but the thought process from Dr. Shoemaker is that these mycotoxins eventually end up in the liver. They collect in the gallbladder. They dump into the bile. And then they're in the intestines. And so we take binders that stay in the intestines to bind up those mycotoxins. And there's uh, plenty of literature to support the idea that actually cholestyramine does bind these uh, biotoxins. So that's one option that's available to people if they have um, the possibility of working with a uh, practitioner, a licensed practitioner who can prescribe that. That being said, it's not my favorite. Um, tastes kind of funky, but some people love it and it <laughs> works well for them. I tend to use different kinds of binders. Um, there's literature to support the idea of using uh, activated charcoal and bentonite clay. I use both of those fairly extensively in my practice as binders. They're inexpensive, they're readily available, they do a pretty decent job at binding those mycotoxins. And the idea is that these mycotoxins are so small, our bodies kind of reabsorb them 
uh, so if they get dumped into the intestine, we want to we want to interfere with that reabsorption, and so that's how the binders work, um, binding those toxins, and they get excreted in the stool, and so that they don't, they don't get um, pulled back into the body, and so it's a very slow process uh, to try and uh, pull out those uh, mycotoxins. There are a couple other binders that, that I've used, including chlorella, so that's a nice binder as well. Sometimes the choice of binder depends upon the kinds of mold and mycotoxins that are um, that one is exposed to. Some binders are better tolerated than others. One of the challenges with binders is they can literally bind you up, and so people get constipated. <laughs> so you have to manage the constipation as well. Um, my favorite go-to for constipation is magnesium. So if people get constipated with their binders, they can um, bump up their magnesium and solve that problem. Um, and then, honestly, my favorite treatment for mold is something called phosphatidylcholine which is a big name for a really important molecule. And it is the building block of every cell in the body. So on the outer membrane of every single cell in the body, uh, we have this phosphatidylcholine. And since the mycotoxins are about the size of this, you know, cell membrane or smaller, um, taking phosphatidylcholine actually clears out the mycotoxins from the cells. And I've just found that it works great. It's good for all different sorts of things. <clears throat> and I can uh, tell you a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, so I use binders and phosphatidylcholine as my primary go-tos for treating mold and mycotoxins. Do you prefer liposomal phosphatidylcholine or do you use uh, other forms of phosphatidylcholine? Um, I use both oral and IV phosphatidylcholine. I, the particular brand that I use is not liposomal, but you can create, make it into a liposome. Uh, you mix the liquid uh, in water, put it in a magic bullet, and bam, you've got a liposome. Um, <laughs> so that works pretty well if you want to make your own liposome. <laughs> the benefit of the liposome is that it is more well absorbed. Um, not all phosphatidylcholine is created equal. I think there are several different uh, professional line products that are going to be um, more effective than others. So you get what you pay for, is what I would say. Do you have brand names for those? Um, I do. Um, personally, I use Body Bio. That would be the, the phosphatidylcholine uh, that I would recommend. There are other, a couple other uh, decent quality products. I know Quicksilver makes one. Um, I think Seeking Health has one. But my personal preference is Body Bio. That's been the one that really transformed my my life and it's continued to be incredibly beneficial for my patients so and when you're using bentonite clay as a binder are you having people actually drink the clay or drinking the water that's coming off of the clay good question i um i had them find a uh a capsule source so that they don't have to do the, the clay um, but I, I think if you're if you have the powder I think you actually have to drink the clay <laughs> it's really tasty too <laughs> yeah so you could put it in a capsule and you can make your own capsules and do it that way that's typically how I do it um, and as I said some people do better with charcoal. Some people will do better with clay. Personally, I'm a big fan of charcoal. That one works better with my system. Me and clay don't get along, so <laughs> 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 so I, I use charcoal, but clay works very effectively too. Awesome. Well, do you have any more that you would like to say about mold? I could say a few more things about phosphatidylcholine. Sure. Um, so PC... Uh, has been used in Europe and Asia for decades. There's no toxic effects, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then 
The literature supports its use for liver issues, prevention of gallstones, kidney issues, uh, cholesterol issues, atherosclerosis, headaches, dementia, uh, insomnia, basically any inflammatory condition. So I just love PC. There's really nobody who wouldn't benefit from it. Um, and there are some special labs in Europe that my colleagues have been able to utilize that literally show um, where the toxins sit on your DNA and um, so basically the epigenetic insult and then what they show is after these patients receive phosphatidylcholine the toxins are gone wow it's quite impressive um, and unfortunately you need a lot you need like one gram per kilo body weight <laughs> of, of pc so it, it takes a while to get there but it has had a transformative um capability so i just i love pc and the other question i was going to ask of you is there specific testing people can do on themselves for um, to see their mold exposure and to see what they're exposed to? That's a great question. There, um, so as I've mentioned several times now, Richie Shoemaker came up with a list of labs um, that get dysfunctional when people have mold exposure. The labs have become harder and harder for practitioners to order. Um, a couple of the inflammatory markers have to be sent to specific locations and it's just a little complicated. It's not often covered by insurance and I don't always find that they correlate. Um, so I used to do a lot more blood testing for these what we call mycotoxin or biotoxin markers. I'm doing less of it now. Um, and then there are a couple labs out there that do mycotoxin testing in urine, which um, many practitioners order, and I've definitely ordered on patients too. Um, some some of them were incredibly expensive, like $700. Um, and so I, I was really hard pressed to ask patients to pay $700 for a test when I knew that they were going to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars to remediate their home. And if I knew from their history that they had mold exposure, I didn't really feel like I needed another test to tell me that. Um, and I had an interesting experience that I'll tell you about in the, the just a few minutes that we have left. Um, I had a husband and wife who I had been seeing the wife for about four years, and then the husband came in to see me. The wife was completely debilitated. She had migraines and chronic diarrhea and chronic fatigue. Um, she was on on disability. She would have episodes where she would just fall down on the floor while she was working, and so she really couldn't work anymore. And I had explored mold as a possibility very early on, but you know she was convinced that it wasn't an issue. And so we explored the whole Lyme thing and we were treating her for Lyme, but she really wasn't getting any better. And then um, her husband came to see me. He was working as a school teacher, but he was got a little bit of hypertension and he was actually developing some anxiety uh, for children. So he was having some trouble with his work um, because he wasn't feeling so great and his libido was pretty low and we evaluated him. But the, the kicker came when um, the hot water heater from the apartment above theirs fell through the ceiling, their kitchen ceiling, oh. and it um, scattered stachybotrys and mold everywhere. Oh no. And so clearly mold was a huge issue for this couple and they, they 
they quickly moved out. They had to move out and put everything in storage. And we did urine mycotoxin testing on both of them simultaneously. And his test was off the charts. They look at three different mycotoxins. I think one was five times higher than normal. One was 10 times higher than normal. So pretty, pretty substantial evidence there. Her test showed absolutely no mycotoxins in her urine. Huh. So what do you think about that? It's like, <laughs> she's super sick. She was so sick, she couldn't excrete any of the mycotoxins. Oh, wow. Um, and I use this as an illustration to remind people that, you know, the tests, we have to interpret the tests in the context of the the history of the of the situation and so she was so sick that she was not even capable of excreting the mycotoxins that is fascinating that's a really good point to make even for practitioners that are interpret interpreting all these results that they should be looking at that as well sometimes it's not just the numbers on the paper yeah exactly so i've you know, I, I do these tests because patients ask for them. I do them, like in this case, they were trying to, you know, get money back from the landlord because they lost everything. Um, but it, it, the tests are not perfect. None of the tests are perfect. And so that leads me back to taking a really good history and then, you know, treating with things that I know are going to be helpful and that aren't going to be harmful. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Kelly. Thank you so much for all this information. There's a ton of valuable stuff here about mold, and I'm really glad that you were able to come on. Uh, people can find you at thespringcenter.com. Are you anywhere else online, social media? Not really at that point. I'm in the process of... Um, of uh, Im improving that. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, I'll be more readily available. But yes, I have a uh, practice in Southern California. Um, I do have uh, patients who find me uh, from all over the country and either um, work with me on um, over the phone or on Skype or uh, make the, the journey to Southern California because it's not a bad place to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a lot drier than a lot of the other places around here. So <laughs> uh, Most of the time, yes. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me, Brian. I've really enjoyed our time today and hope that this was helpful information for your listeners. Oh, it definitely will be. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. There you have it, folks. Kelly brought a ton of fantastic information about mold. This entire episode was packed full of info that you guys can use to determine whether you might be facing a mold issue. Now, I would like to explain how my mold toxicity occurred, and it was from a couple different things. One, I really like to sleep in the cold, and I like to be really warm in my bed, so I, I typically sleep with my window open. Now, being in a really wet environment up here in Washington, what was happening is moisture would be coming in through the window and that mold was growing around the windowsill and my windowsill is black so you couldn't see. But that led into mold growing in other areas of the room as well and it was kind of spreading until I got really sick. Now another spot in the house that had a lot of mold was in the bathroom because there was water getting underneath some of the tiles as well. So the symptoms that I was uh, having when I was exposed, exposed to mold was I started out with a really stiff neck to the point where I could barely move it. And then my entire body started to stiffen up. And it was like having the flu where all my joints and everything just started to ache. But then I also de developed headaches and I lost all my energy. And every single day when I would wake up, I wouldn't have enough energy to really make it through the day. So I would wake up and work, and then right when I would get home, I would go right back to bed. And at that point, I had stopped hiking. I stopped doing any kind of exercise whatsoever because I physically did not have the energy to be able to uh, do anything. And so once I got onto a mold protocol, 
this was about 12 to 13 weeks in, then these symptoms started to subside pretty quickly. And at that point, I had tried antibiotics. I had tried all sorts of stuff. I was tested for a mono and a strep. Um, that was another thing. I had massive sore throats that entire time. Um, but once I went on to a mold protocol, then within a week, I got my uh, energy back and I was able to get back outside. And then I was able to start figuring out where the heck the mold was coming from and what to do about it. So if you do feel like your symptoms might be mold related, then start taking a look around your house to see if you might be exposed somewhere within your own home. If you like this episode, then please go on to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Those ratings and reviews help to get us out in front of more people, so please take the time to do that. You can go to summitforwellness.com slash iTunes to leave your rating and review. Keep on climbing to the peak of your health, and we will see you next time.